This is Sharon Cluck, and we are going to be looking at Luke 10 today. Um, I have a website, mindofmessiah.com. You can find my book there and some of my teachings. You can also look here on this um, YouTube channel under Sharon Cluck, and some of it's posted as Mind of Messiah, and you'll see that on the, on the uh, beginning of the screen when you look for my teachings. So um, today we're looking at Luke 10, and the whole purpose is because Jesus says some pretty significant things in this chapter to the 70 that he sends out to go before him. So we're going to take a look at that and see if those things that he said to them and spoke to them apply to us as well today. And I think you're going to find out they do. So I don't ever want to teach you anything that isn't in the word and I can't prove it by the word. So today that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to see in the word what he intends for us to be doing with our life here on this earth. So we're going to start in Luke uh, 10, the first, uh, the first verse. And that reads, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also, and he sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would come. So I'm just going to read through this and comment just a little bit. Then I'm going to come back and paraphrase to you what it is that I see in this chapter. So in verse one, it looks like that he has two sets of 70. And the reason that I say that is the word other 70 means a different set of 70. An alternate are the next set of 70. I've never seen that before. I thought that he had the 12 and that he had the 70. But according to the way that this reads in the Greek, he had more than one set of 70. So he tells them that, um, that the harvest is great. And that can mean that it's large or it's already past. So if it's great, it could actually already be past or spent. And for us today, what that's basically saying is you guys are running out of time. The harvest is great. You're running out of time. So I think we can truly say that. In verse two, it says, therefore, setting unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. So a laborer is somebody that toils. It's a teacher, a worker. And he tells us to pray that we would have laborers, more laborers. And when it says pray, that word is G1189. It means to petition God for that. Beseech him or to beg him for more laborers. And we have to say to ourselves, do we do this? Do we even pray for those that are already doing the labor? And do we pray for God to send more? How faithful are we about that? Verse three, go your way. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. So the word script here, because people kind of, think maybe that's a scroll or whatever that's not what that means a script is a pouch for food so he's telling them don't prepare for yourself when i send you out let me give you people who assist you along the way and into whatever house you enter first say peace be to this house verse six and if the son of peace be there your peace shall rest upon it and if not it shall return to you again. Verse seven. And in the same house, remain. Eat and drink such things as they give. For the labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. So don't be going from house to house looking for something better. When you get there and they receive you, then accept what they have given you. Verse eight. And into whatever city you enter and they receive you, Eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. 
heal the sick. The word heal, that's a phrase, heal the sick. That's in the Greek 2323. You're going to find this interesting. Heal the sick means to adore God. Isn't that amazing? To adore God. Are to release disease. It means to cure. It means to worship. So apparently, when you worship, Jehovah cures. And I've told you many times that worship is warfare. Luke 10 10. But into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you not, go your way out into the street of the same and say. So you make this declaration. He wants you to say something when you're not received. You take nothing of them with you when you leave. You have talked about this before, or so we have talked about this before, that we are cautious of things given to us or sent to us even in the mail. If you don't know that person's life, they may be sending you something that is cursed and you don't want to take that cursed thing into your house. So I have lots of stories about this and we're not near as cautious about that as what we should be. So I'm not making this up. The Bible speaks of the not bringing the cursed thing into your family or into your house because it affects you. So things, objects can actually carry a spirit with it. And we've seen this with stuffed animals. We've seen it with objects that people have given them or they bought in foreign countries. These are, you know, we can talk about this when we close if you want to, because I have tons of stories about bringing the cursing into your house and what it does. So Luke 10, 11. So what they do in Luke uh, 10, 10 is they literally go out in the street. And, and if you remember, they're barefoot. They can't even take shoes with them. They're barefoot. And they go out and they take the dirt that's on their feet and even get that off of them. They don't want to take anything of that city that resists the word of God with them. They want to go out pure without carrying any of that deception or any of that rejection of God with them. So verse 11, even the very dust of your city which cleaves on us. So they're still making this proclamation to the city. They're saying, even the very dust of your city, which cleaves on us, we do wipe off against you. We're leaving it here. We don't even want to take any element, not even dust with us. Notwithstanding, be you sure of this, still talking to the city, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But I say unto you, now Jesus is talking, that it shall be more tolerable in the day for Sodom than for that city. Woe unto thee, Chorisa. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works have been done in Tyre and Sidon, which have been done in you, they had a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. So if Sodom and Gomorrah would have seen the things that Tyre and Sidon saw when Jesus came into their town, they would have repented. They wouldn't have been destroyed. So Tyre and Sidon and Carissa is worse than Sodom and Gomorrah in that they totally reject Jesus himself in the flesh. Luke 10, 14. But it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. Um, so he's saying, even though they have rejected the things done, if you are rejecting the kingdom of God that's come to you. So they've gone into these cities and they've brought healing to people and still they reject the kingdom of God. And so what Jesus is saying, these other cities didn't have the opportunity to do that. And they ended up destroyed. Don't think you're going to escape. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, shall be thrust down to hell. And you know, I wanted to do some study on this about Capernaum and why he said they were exalted up to heaven. And I forgot to do that. So 
I need to check that. I'd like to know why he says that they are exalted to heaven. Verse 16, he that heareth you heareth me. So Jesus is talking to these 70s sending out. When they hear you, they hear me. You need to take that personal. If people hear the gospel that you share, they are literally listening to Jesus himself. And he that despises you despises me. So we have people who despise what we do, who despise the word that we put out, who despise the gospel. Well, they despise not just us, they despise God himself. And he that despises me despises him that sent me. When someone receives the word, he receives Jesus. So when somebody actually responds to what we share, they actually will receive Jesus. When they hear the word of God and they receive the word of God, it will change their life. So now the 70 return. This is verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, or Yeshua, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. This isn't one devil. This is devils. This is plural. Luke 18, 10, 10, 18. And he said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fallen from heaven. He already knows the power he has over Satan. He already knows his power is greater. And he saw Satan falling from heaven because he's the one who threw him out. He also witnessed from where he was what was happening as these 70 are taking authority over demons. So they've gone out to heal, but while they're healing, they're casting out devils. We've talked about this frequently. Many times in the Bible, when devils are cast out, healing comes, sickness leaves. We see that frequently in the scriptures. Behold, I give unto you power. So this is verse 19. Behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents. That means um, something that pierces or stings. Scorpions. The, the words actually scorpions are something that pierces or sting. Serpents is um, something that lies cunning, malicious, a malicious person and especially satan so when he says i give you power to tread upon serpents he's talking about treading upon the devil and upon scorpions those are things that pierce this um the number on serpents is at 3789 and he says and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Let me read that again. I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. We're going to come back to this in a little bit. Verse 20, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits, which are superhuman angels, that's uh, 4151, subject unto you. It can also, the spirits can also mean breath. It can mean life. It can mean, but in this context, he's talking about superhuman angels, which is listed under 4151. <clears throat> Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your name is written in heaven. <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> verse 21 in that hour jesus rejoiced in spirit and he said he's praying to the father i thank thee O father lord of heaven and of earth so if you want to know who the father or the god of this earth really is it's yeshua, it's yeshua his father jehovah that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, 
for so it seemed good in your sight. So when his disciples go out and they bring healing and they take authority over devils, it makes Jesus happy. He rejoices. So much so that he turns to the father. He says, father, look at what's going on here. This is so awesome. They're doing what I taught them to do. He's rejoicing. When you do what he's taught us to do in the word, he rejoices. So let's look at the word babes. You've revealed this unto babes. That's 3516. That means a minor, a simple-minded person, or an immature Christian. So he didn't take the most learned people in the country, the experts in Torah, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. He took simple-minded and baby Christians. You know they were baby Christians. Jesus only had a three-year ministry, three and a half years. And so even if this is at the end of it, they can't have had a relationship with him for longer than that. I find it interesting that he talked for three and a half years. Tribulation, three and a half years. Yeah, it is interesting. <clears throat> so what Ben's talking about is he taught three and a half years yeah. in tribulation. <clears throat> the great tribulation is three and a half years. So the first time that I ever cast out a devil, I had no idea what I was doing. Totally dumb, ignorant of what I was doing. I had been not even been saved for two full years, but I showed up when I was called. Someone called me and they said, will you please come and help? And my late husband and I showed up. We had no clue. We didn't even know what we were gonna get drug into. We thought we were gonna just come and pray while somebody else did all this stuff and that we could observe and learn. Didn't <laughs> happen that way. So I showed up and God showed up. It is not about being the wise and the prudent. It's being used of God is about your faith and your obedience. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'm going to start over and kind of paraphrase what I see in this. And we're going to cover a few more things. After these things, the Lord appointed another 70 and he sent them two by two. This is really a good idea. That anytime you go to pray for somebody, it's always great to have a second person. I mean, where any, any two are gathered together, there he is in the midst. It just makes sense that you have a backup. And even when somebody comes for ministry here, um, in the beginning, Ben felt very inadequate in helping. And now that he has learned a lot more, he has uh, discernment. He can see things. He can hear things. He sees in the spirit. And he's a great asset. And so even if he sits there and says nothing, I can kind of look over at him and get his strengthful approval or acknowledgement. Yes, I agree. Or I don't think you should go that way. Or let me help you get a different direction. It always helps to have a second person. Does that mean you can't pray for somebody by yourself? No, it doesn't mean that. Because you and the Holy Spirit are a majority. You show up with God. And the two of you together can get something done. So he sends them out two by two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself will go. So it says sent before him. So Jesus had an itinerary of where he planned to go. And he sent the 70 before him two by two to prepare the way. So how do, how do they do that? Well, these are not just the inner circle of his 12 disciples. These are others that he trusted. He gave them instructions as to why they were going. This is what you're going to do when you get there. The harvest is truly great. He told us when he was at Samaria, when he was at the well with the woman, that the fields were white to harvest. So what we have to say, do you think the fields are still white? 
Do you think there's still people that need to be harvested? Yeah, uh-huh. Are there still any that need or want to hear of their deliverance? Do, are there people who need to be delivered? More than ever. So many have never heard. And why? Because the laborers are few. He is speaking to them, but he says, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers. So who's the Lord of the harvest? It's Yeshua. He is the Lord of the harvest. And we're asking him to help send more laborers. So he tells them to go. And he also tells them, listen, guys, when you go, you're going to be like lambs in the middle of wolves. I don't even have to look that up. It's exactly what it says. You're going to be like a lamb in the middle of wolves. So why would he send lambs into a pack of wolves? Not only that, he tells them not to even take a purse. Don't even take anything to eat. So I'm guessing they're not supposed to be taking any money, no shoes. What? They're not even taking their shoes? Because he knows that when he sends somebody out, that their needs are met and they're provided for. Mm -hmm. I think we're right for the people to the blood people. Amen. Yeah. Exactly. And what John just said, it's just like the Israelites that left Egypt. They were provided for in the wilderness yeah. for 40 years and their clothes didn't even wear out. Their shoes didn't even wear out. So wherever you can find hospitality, accept it. And don't go looking for something better, but impart peace to that house, accept what they serve you to eat, and you are laboring among them, so accept it graciously. It's not like you're taking advantage of somebody. If you're going to some place and you're going to minister to them and they receive healing and they receive the kingdom of God through your witness and your testimony, then it graciously receive your uh, labor deserves to be supplied for. The workman is worthy of his hire. Now, these are your instructions. This is what he tells them to do. These are your instructions. This is what he's telling you to do. Heal the sick. How do they do that? They are to say the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. When we begin to minister to people, if we understood that the kingdom of God within us is coming nigh unto somebody else, when we come to them, we are bringing them the kingdom of God. It is in us. If we are full of the power of the Holy Spirit and we are bringing any kind of message from the Lord, then we are bringing the kingdom of God. It's come nigh you. If we can pray for people and they get supernaturally healed, that is the kingdom of God coming near. It's showing up. It's here on earth. It's not up there. We don't go up, have to chase it and go to heaven to get it. It's right here. He said, the word of God is nigh thee, even in your mouth and in your heart. So the instructions are that when they go, they heal the sick. He didn't say, preach the gospel, tell them I'm going to be crucified and they can be born again. He said, heal the sick, heal the sick. So how do they do that? By saying the kingdom of God is nigh unto you. They understand that when they are in the presence of somebody else, they have brought the kingdom of God. What does the kingdom of God have? Well, it doesn't have sickness. Sickness. The kingdom of God doesn't have sickness. The kingdom of God doesn't have poverty. The kingdom of God doesn't have lack. It doesn't have liars. It doesn't have seducers. It's not evil. It is life. John 10.10 10 says, Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. It is a kingdom of darkness that comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He will steal your health. He will kill your relationships. He will destroy your finances. He's a killer, a destroyer. But Jesus comes to give life. And when he gives you life, not only did he give you life at birth, 
and knit you in the womb of your mother and put all of your cells together and breathe life into you and put his name within your DNA, but he is giving you life to give to other people. Life and life more abundantly. So how did the kingdom of God come unto them? So he came, it came through those that Jesus sent out. So can we say that? When you enter into someone's house, are you bold enough to say the kingdom of God has come unto you? It's a good way to start. Yeah. When we go to minister to somebody or somebody has a need, or even if we see them in the store and they need healing, we can see them that they're sick and, and wounded or needing assistance in some way. If, if we could just say, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. You talk about an opener, they probably go, okay, I never heard that before, but that's what Jesus told his disciples to say. Why can't we say that? The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. I think I'm going to start saying that phrase. When people are in my presence, I want to have the mindset that I am carrying the kingdom of God within me. And if that's true, then the kingdom of God, it should be easy for someone to get healed. So if we really understand that we're carrying the kingdom of God within us, it shouldn't be hard for healing to manifest in those that we are ministering to. It would be really nice if we would just ooze the presence of God and that when people get near us, that they could tell that we've been with God. I've been around people like that. I wish that I was more like that. In verse 10, Jesus tells them, if they don't receive you, just go your way. Don't take it personal. But make a declaration as you go. So don't just go and ponder it and think about it. And you know why I think he had them to make a declaration when they went? Because otherwise we would go away wounded and thinking, oh, they rejected me. You know, I tried so hard to share with them and they just rejected me. I just feel so bad. I wasn't able to get anything done. No. You make a de declaration as you go. Be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. However, I'm going to wipe the very dust of this city that clings to my feet off, and I'm not taking any of your curses and unbelief with me when I go. But know this, that when you reject the king of the heavenlies, which is here in your presence, dwelling in me, there are consequences of your rejection. When you make a declaration like that, that depression of feeling rejected doesn't have any hold on you. You made the declaration. You announced that it wasn't you who failed. It was them who rejected the word of God. And it allows you to have boldness to move on to the next person and not feel like a failure. In verse 13, Jesus begins to name some of the cities that have rejected him and what that will cost them. In verse 16, Jesus says that he that hears you, hears me. So if they despise you, they despise me. And if they despise me, then they despise Yahweh who sent me. Again, he wants them not to take this personally. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting the message that you're bringing. They're rejecting Christ in you. Yeah. It's not about, oh, they, they'd be happy to go have a beer with you. <laughs> they, they'd be happy to tell dirty jokes with you. But when you bring in the kingdom of God and it doesn't set well with them, remember, it's not you they're rejecting. They would receive you under a different circumstance. It's not you. It's who you've become because you're no longer the old man. You're a new man. You're a new creation. Everything is brand new and they don't recognize it. They don't know how to see that or comprehend it or understand it. So the 70 go out and they're like sheep among wolves. 
but they go anyway. So sometimes we feel afraid. You know, um, the word courage wouldn't exist if it wasn't in the face of fear. There has to be fear before you can be courageous, before you can overcome it. So just because you get in the presence of fear doesn't mean that you run or that you avoid it. It means you face it and you're courageous, like a good soldier, like Paul told Timothy, like a good soldier. They're carrying with them the kingdom of God. The power of the creator of heaven and earth is residing in them. And so what happens when that, when that is like that? Do they get eaten by the wolves? 70 returned. None of them got ate up by the wolves. They went out like little sheep in the middle of a pack of wolves. But nobody got ate up. They all returned. And they returned victoriously. So we see in verse 17 that the 70 return and they're joyful. They're amazed. They exclaim with delight. Even the devils are subject unto us through your name. They're not taking any credit for this. They know it's the issue is name that is responding. It's causing the enemy to respond. They're fully aware that it is the name and the power of the name that makes the devil subject to them. That's a mouthful that makes the devil subject to you. That's what this passage is talking about. Devils were subject to the disciples of Jesus. Are you a disciple of Jesus? You should have these signs following you. You should know that the power within you is greater. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So in verse 18, Jesus basically says, yeah, I know. I saw what happened. <laughs> I saw that. He's already seen Satan fall from heaven by the power of his name. And this is no surprise to Jesus. He expected it to happen. He's well equipped these that are sent out ones. He lives in them. He lives in them. And he's given them the authority to use his name, the power of attorney, as if he is actually there. That's how we have to begin to see that when we speak, it is Jesus within us speaking. That's why I have a problem with people who don't like lady preachers. I just want to go, excuse me, there's no male, no female, no bond, no free. If Jesus is in me, then it's the man inside me. And Paul talks about that you have to be God inside minded and that, that there is the man of Christ that lives in you. In you is a man. So when you speak, it's that man, Yeshua, Jesus, who does the speaking. He didn't care what vessel you live in. He cares that he lives and he speaks through you. So he is well equipped these sent out ones. He lives in them. He's given the authority to use their names and the power of attorney. So, oh my gosh, think about this. This, this is an amazing story. These guys have never seen anything like this. They're hanging out with Jesus and he says, go do what I do. They're hanging out with Jesus. He says, I'm going to send you out and I'm not just going to send you where the straight is straight, narrow path and, and there's no dangers and there's no, no, I'm going to send you where it's dangerous. And when you get there, people are going to get healed and devils are going to get cast out. And they go and that happens. And they come back and they go, oh my gosh, even the devils are subject to you through us. When we speak, the same thing happens that happens when you speak. I don't know about you, but I find that extremely awesome. We should be living that. Verse 19 says, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Think about what he just said. I give you power over all the power 
of the enemy. Now there's a few words in there. If you want to break it down, he talks about, you know, I have to go back and look at that verse. Let me look at that. That what's it say in 19? Read, read it to me, Chrissy. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. Okay. He shall be my enemy in church. Okay, so he says, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. So if you even take out the, the definitions of what you're treading on, the serpents and scorpions, what it says is I give you power over all power. I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Have you ever thought of yourself as having power over all the power of the enemy? Have you ever seen yourself like that? That's how Jesus sees you. Amen. I agree. He's given you power over all the power of the enemy. I just, I just find that so amazing. He doesn't say the devil doesn't have any power. We know that he does. But the power was subject to the power in the 70s, which was Jesus. They had brought the kingdom of God to every town that they entered. They had the power of the name of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus had not even been shed yet. They had his name. He told them they would trample or tread on serpents and scorpions. And nothing by any means will hurt you. So we already read that this is babies that are going out, guys. So when somebody says to you, oh, you've got to really be careful. Don't get involved in this. Thing. We're not asking you to go on a witch hunt, but I'm telling you what, the enemy is going to show up and you have to know who's in charge. If you don't, it won't be him that gets trampled. It will be you. Nothing by any means, any means, any means, will hurt you. So we have folks that are fearful. They try to scare us about encounters that we might have with the enemy. But if we're coming with the kingdom of God inside of us, we walk today in the same power that Jesus gave these 70 disciples. He never looked, he never took this power away. It was the last thing Jesus quoted as saying before his ascension. So we're going to flip over to Mark 16. We're going to start at 14. This is right before the ascension of Jesus. So he has been crucified. Mark 16, verse 14. He has been crucified, impaled, tortured. He has taken the keys to death, hell, and the grave. He has walked among the disciples for 40 days. He's promised them in 10 more days that they will get the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's not leaving them orphanless. I heard somebody explain this the other day, that when a rabbi, when somebody, these people were all raised by their rabbis or taught by the rabbis, but when their rabbi departs or goes somewhere else, that they feel like an orphan. This rabbi, Yeshua, is getting ready to ascend into the heavenlies. And he says, don't worry, you're not going to be left like an orphan because I'm sending the Holy Spirit. He will teach you. He will teach you all things whatsoever that I have, I have said unto you. He is going to be just like me. He's my representation. So Mark 16, 14. <clears throat> Afterward, he appeared unto the 11. So he's talking to the 11. We don't have Judas, so we don't have 12. Now we have 11, as they said at me. So they're sitting around at a table and they're conversing. He upbraided them with their unbelief or he chastens them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. So these are 11 guys that walk with Jesus and they have hardness of heart. They have unbelief. I know, we just, I, people are shaking their heads. How could that be? Well, that's why 
the man that came to Jesus for healing of his son says, I believe help thou my unbelief. All of us still have areas of unbelief that we're walking in. And we need to understand what Jesus has done for us so we will quit walking in that unbelief. And the reason that he's correcting them is because they didn't believe them which had seen him after he was risen. So when some said Jesus, Jesus rose, they went, nah. Instead of going, hallelujah, they went, nah. And some of us still have a hard time believing some of the things we see in here today too. So he's speaking to his inner circle. And he says that some have unbelief and hardness of heart. So why was our heart hard? It was because of unbelief. They refused to believe the others when they testified of his resurrection. So what do you refuse to believe that I'm telling you today? Something to ponder. What do you resist when you read or hear the word? Jesus goes on to say, Matthew 16, 15. He says unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So he's giving them an assignment. He's given you and I an assignment. You need to know what that is. Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So how do you get saved? You believe and you're baptized. So he's just corrected them for not believing. And now he says, for those who will believe enough to follow him in baptism, that those are the people that will be saved. So he's talking to them about their unbelief. And then he's telling them the reward of those who will believe. You go out, you teach, and those that do believe that I was risen from the dead, those that do believe that I am the son of God, and they will follow me in baptism, they shall be saved or have eternal life. So verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Did we not just establish who the believers were? the ones who got baptized. Did you believe and did you get baptized? Did you believe enough that you said, I'm gonna follow him and I'm gonna get dunked in this water and I'm gonna die to myself and I'm gonna come back alive under Christ. Mm -hmm. Then he must be talking to you because it says, and these signs shall follow those that believe. He just told you those that believe are the ones who get baptized in my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. If you are a believer and you are baptized, then these are things that happen in your life. The ones that do believe the report of his resurrection and follow him in baptism, that's you. So if you've done that, then you should be able to cast out devils. So where are these devils? Where are they that you're to cast out? Yeah, they're residing in people. They're operating in principalities. Paul tells us that we, we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against uh, principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this world, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to pulling down of strongholds, that we're supposed to bring every thought into subjection and bring it into obedience and to the word of God. We're not supposed to let our thoughts cause us to have fear. It causes us to have unbelief. We made a decision. We made a decision that Jesus Christ was crucified for our sin, that he took our sin. He was impaled for our, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes, by the beating that he took, we are healed. Not we're going to be healed. Not maybe someday could be possibly 
but you were. It's already paid for. It's already done. So these devils are in people. These devils are in politics. They're over governments. They're principalities. And we are supposed to be taking authority over that because he gave us power over all their power. He gave us power to tread. That's what we're supposed to be doing, treading. You need to put the devil's name on the bottom of your shoe and start treading, start walking. These boots are made for walking. <laughs> I'm gonna walk all over you. So what does it mean to be, to believe and to be baptized? And according to Galatians 2.20, this is what it tells us. It's about death to yourself. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So you don't get to your personality, your thoughts, your intentions, everything. You have to share this place with Jesus. This is not just your body and your temple all alone. You're sharing this with Jesus. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, this flesh body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. We have to live by faith. If we live by fear, we will activate the devil. If we live by faith, we will activate Yahweh. And who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what being born again is. Being crucified with Christ and coming alive unto him again. It is by his faith that you live this new life. It's an ongoing life of faith. It's not a one-time event. It's not, a, I decided to follow Jesus. I got my ticket to heaven. I'm on my way. No, this is every day, every day, every day. We live by faith every day. It's a daily death. Quit doing what you want to do. Quit thinking you have rights. Quit thinking you earned this. We are dead. We don't have rights to anything. We are servants of the most high God. We belong to him. We all have been given a measure of faith. And this is a gift. So even the faith that it takes to believe is a gift. So when we go back to Mark 16, what happens to those people that believe and are baptized? Remember, we already established that that's you. They have the power of Christ. Amen. So this verse must, must, must apply to you. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, including anything the government tries to stick in you. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Not maybe, they shall recover. That's what believers do. You wanna know your assignment? That's it. You go and make disciples, you lay hands on the sick and they recover. You tread upon serpents and scorpions and all the, all the power of the enemy because the power in you is greater than the power in him. So I looked up this word, um, they shall recover. It isn't always a miracle. So what happens if it doesn't happen right away? We just keep laying hands on people. And we keep praying until we get the desired results. We don't care how long it takes. We just be persistent. We, can believe, we can't believe everything we see. Just because we don't see an instant miracle doesn't mean that the miracle's not on its way. We must believe the words it says they will recover. So let me give you a good example of this. All of you know the story of Daniel who fasts and prays and he sets himself to, to face the Lord and he opens up the windows and faces towards Jerusalem. He prays day and night for three, day, three weeks 
and no answer comes. And all of a sudden the answer comes. Well, when was the answer sent? When he started praying. So just because you pray for someone and you don't see an immediate healing doesn't mean it's not on its way. That's why when we pray for people, we rebuke the enemy, we rebuke the spirit of infirmity, we rebuke the spirit of unbelief, we take authority over any kind of darkness or walls that are set up to stop that healing from coming. We take authority over what might be in the principalities. We ask God to send angels to assist us to bring the answer to our prayer. It is already being dispatched. And what we do is we go, I guess it's not going to happen. We just negate the answers on its way. And the angels are going, oh, they quit believing. Oh, oh, I guess I'm not supposed to deliver this. I mean, I don't know what the angels say. I'm just imagining that. But I'm, I'm telling you, if I had some, if I were an angel, and I'm not, but if I were, and I'm coming, 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 coming with an answer, and somebody goes, oh, it's just not going to happen. We're going to give up on that. We'll try something else. We'll go the way of the world. We'll look to science instead of looking to God. And it's like the angel goes, you just tied my hands. You just stopped my delivery. I was on the way, and I got a message not to come. Shut your mouth. Quit negating the things you prayed for. Keep believing for the miracles that you have asked God for. Let him work through your confession of faith, not your confession of doubt and unbelief. Believe God. Keep believing. And if you don't see the manifestation, keep thanking him for it, that it's on the way. Thank you that it's on the way. It's on the way. It's on the way. And we're going to rejoice right now, knowing that we received it, just like we will when it shows up. We're going to believe that we receive when we pray. That's what the Bible tells us to do. Okay. So that's recovery. They will recover. So Mark 16, 19 to finish the chapter. So they, so then after the Lord spoke to them, he was received up in heaven and he sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and they preached everywhere. The Lord working with them. The Lord, Yeshua, the Holy Spirit, working with them. You don't go alone. You're not alone. He's working with you. And confirming the word. So you go, you speak. He confirms what you speak with signs that follow. It doesn't say that they go in front of you. Signs that follow you. So even if you walk out and you haven't seen the manifestation or the miracle, doesn't mean it's not coming. It follows. Besides that, as you go, they keep on following you. I always think about that script where she, uh, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I used to get up and go, goodness, hi, hi, mercy, oh, hello, you're following me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy. The Lord God is good. When he met uh, Abraham on the mountain, that's what he said, that his goodness passed before him. He couldn't see him, but his goodness, he is good. He's a good, good father. He brings good, good gifts. So they went out, they did what he said, they preached everywhere, and Yahweh worked with them. Yeshua, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit was there to work with them. You're not doing this alone. Quit thinking you need to get enough courage to speak. Quit thinking that you're intimidated or you're worried about what somebody will think or say about you. Who cares? We care what God thinks about us. I'm not telling you not to use wisdom and look like a dummy out there. But if you get a prompting to go pray for somebody, you get a prompting from the Holy Spirit to speak a word, you do that. Don't walk in fear. 
let him work with you. When he stirs you up to start moving, it's because he's already working in you. He's already saying to you, Chrissy, go over there and do such and such. Go, go lay hands on Dom. Tell him God's got a plan for his life. Do what you're told to do because that's the Holy Spirit. The devil ain't going to tell you to do that. And when you got this unction and you almost feel this nervousness because you just feel like you got to say something. Believe me, that is the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. So he never stops working with us. It's us who gives up. He desires to confirm his word. So the example of his evangelism was to first that he sent out people that would heal. That's what Jesus did before he went into a town, sent out people that would heal. And when they were healed, then they were ready to listen. If you are willing to pray every chance you get for those who need healing or delivered, we would see many come to Jesus. When people see a miracle or they get healed, they've been pain a long time. I'm telling you, they're ready to hear when that pain gets delivered or set free. They would see the power of the kingdom of God that had come to them. So what do we have to lose? And what's our excuse? So Jesus said, if we don't believe, we're hard-hearted. That's what he said in Mark 16th chapter. So Father, we ask you to give us a tender heart. We ask you to set us free from the spirit of unbelief. We take authority over doubt and fear and disbelief. We break its power over us in Jesus' name. We forbid you to continue to operate within our lives. We declare that Jesus is the Lord of our life. We've already followed him in baptism. We declare that we are dead to ourselves. We are dead to sin. We are dead to self-righteousness. We are dead to our pride and our arrogance. But we are alive under Jesus Christ, who lives in us, who speaks through us, and who desires to work with us continually and to give us signs following what we speak by confirming his word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we purpose in our heart to bring the kingdom of God to those around us and to see the word of God manifested the signs following in the name of Jesus. I bless you all for joining us. For those of you that are watching this later, um, you're welcome to subscribe and hit the like button. That will help us to get this word out a little bit more. You can find the rest of these teachings on YouTube under Sharon Cluck, or you can find them at mindofmessiah.com. And we hope you'll join us again next time. God bless.